All right. Thanks for joining us in our survey of some of the, the genres that we find in Scripture. And this genre in particular is one of my favorites. So let's talk a little bit about wisdom literature. And we're talking specifically about the books of Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. So those are usually the books. And then there are some wisdom psalms. Uh, there are wisdom poems that are contained in the prophets. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what it means to be reading wisdom literature. All right. Uh, wisdom literature, or, or just to start with the definition of wisdom, uh, the old dictionary by Noah Webster, which I love to consult because of its uh, uh, spiritual clarity along the way, uh, wisdom is, he says, as a faculty of mind, it is discerning or judging what is most just, proper, and useful. And then wisdom as an acquirement, something that we could pursue and gain for ourselves. Uh, the knowledge and use of what is best, most just, most proper, most conducive to prosperity and happiness. So we are trying to figure out how to live life or what is good and useful what bring us brings us the deepest happiness the deepest contentment for the longest time uh, my teacher in college called it the art of steering uh, so that's what we're steering our lives in a just proper useful direction one that is most conducive uh, not just to uh, prosperity financially, but prosperity in life for the longest time. You could compare that if you look at uh, that same definition in uh, Noah Webster. Uh, he compares wisdom to prudence. And he says, prudence is the exercise of sound judgment in avoiding evil. So we need to know how to avoid evil. And that is prudence. But wisdom goes on. We avoid evil and know what is good to attempt. So wisdom is both the setting aside of what is negative and the acquiring, the attempting that which is truly good, what is truly just and proper. So that is what wisdom is. And uh, I think these are great definitions for us to begin to understand what kind of literature it is that we are looking at. So if we compare wisdom to the Creator, uh, we need to know um, how it relates. Wisdom depends on an objective standard. So the reason we don't talk much about wisdom in our own day is because wisdom in a subjective world is impossible. You have to know where the standard is. You have to know where the line is between right and wrong. And if you don't know that there is an objective line, then wisdom becomes impossible. It must have the character of God as its source um, because God is unchanging because God is good and one of the characteristics one of the qualities one of the attributes that God has within himself from all of eternity is the fact that he is wisdom and so wisdom ultimately and finally can only come from an acknowledgement and an understanding of who God is the physical and moral rules in God's creation are part of what wisdom is. So in this sense, I say that wisdom is that which corresponds to reality. So lots of us walk around. I, I have to admit there are a lot of times when the decisions we make and the thoughts and intents of our heart are not connected to reality. Uh, it reminds me of that R. Kelly song, I Believe I Can Fly. Well, that's nice and wonderful, and we could we could think about all of the wonderful implications of being independent like that. But if we actually tried to live by that rule, uh, we would only make that mistake once, right? Gravity takes over, natural law takes over, and so we need to understand the boundaries, the moral boundaries that God has set in His creation. So not only is He the standard. But his creation teaches us where those physical and moral boundaries are. Finally, wisdom is binary. If you read through the book of Proverbs, it is always talking about the wise man and the fool. 
it necessarily excludes all the middle ground. You were either wise or you were a fool. All the positions in between are just compromises and they're also folly. So that's what wisdom, how wisdom relates to the Creator, especially as we read uh, the book of Proverbs. So here are the three voices that are uh, involved in wisdom. Proverbs says, wisdom is to, the wisdom that is involved in Proverbs is the ability to meet the daily demands of practical good life management. I like that definition. So Proverbs will tell you about uh, uh, parenting. It will tell you about um, the tongue. It'll tell you how to use your money. It'll tell you how to form relationships. Uh, it'll tell you how to lead and how to follow. Um, there are specific Proverbs that meet the daily demands, the decision-making that we do on a regular basis uh, so that our lives could be well-managed. That's Proverbs. For Job, we have the wisdom that begins to look in the longer picture, the deeper thing, beginning to ask about that, that third shift theology. It begins to talk about what happens in the night that we don't understand. What's going on in those calamities that are beyond our control or explanation? And then Ecclesiastes is the kind of wisdom that, I love this definition, that examines the tantalizing hollowness of human life as we consider it under the sun. So that's uh, what Ecclesiastes does. So if you're looking for wisdom that can have a practical impact today on the decisions that you make, Proverbs is for you. Uh, when you're trying to probe some of the mysteries of life when there seems to be boundaries to our knowledge of what's, what's going on, uh, that would be Job. And then for Ecclesiastes, understanding all that we can understand about what it means to live under the sun uh, versus living in light of God's uh, loving care, his sovereignty, his authority, his providence. So those are the three voices. Um, there are a couple of cautions that we want to make in interpreting wisdom literature. First one is make sure you follow the whole argument, especially in the book of Job and Ecclesiastes. Um, Ecclesiastes has suffered a lot by people that don't understand the, the intent. And so make sure that you don't pull out verses in isolation and judge them. Wait for the whole argument. Same with the book of Job. In the book of Job, there are comforters who are giving, giving advice that may or may not align with what is true. So there we are. The second uh, caution we want to make is remember that the Hebrew mind uh, this is a great insight from Derek Hidner. Remember that the Hebrew mind gives itself wholly to one thing at a time with maximum force. It leaves any resulting imbalance to be corrected later by an equally massive countermeasure. I feel like I do this sometimes when I'm preaching. I'll tell my, my congregation that um, I'm going to preach this passage with all of the impact that it was meant to make. Uh, and then I'm not going to answer necessarily the theological balance of another passage. When I get to that passage, I will preach that one uh, with that same kind of force. And my goal, of course, is to preach the whole of Scripture. And uh, I want to do biblical theology. And sometimes the, the comparing of the two tends to water down the argument. And so I want to give it in its full face. So those are a couple of cautions in interpreting wisdom literature. The purposes of the book of Job uh, would include these. Um, it is The book of Job is not uh, given to us to provide answers for innocent suffering, but a powerful defense of God's right to rule in the affairs of men. So you will not get an answer to why. You will get the answer of who, and you can trust him. And then to examine the nature of divine justice. So here is how God rules his universe. At one point, he will say to Satan, behold, he is in your power, but there will be sovereign limits to that kind of test. And it will all be for your maturity, for your growth, and for God's glory. And then Job is a good place to look when you want to answer the question that Satan asks God, does man really serve God for nothing? So those are great uh, 
purposes for the for the reading the book of Job. The structure of Job. Uh, there are two prose bookends that tell us what Job doesn't know. Um, that this is a challenge by Satan and an answer and response by God. And all Job knows is what's happening in the poetic section. Uh, in the poetic section, there are these four voices. There are the voices of Job's comforters who get less and less comforting every time they speak uh, and more and more accusatory in the way that they accuse Job of sin and then lots of sin to require that God judge him in the way that it seems like God is. Then there's the voice of Job, the innocent sufferer. I couldn't have done this much wrong to get this much pain. Then there's a voice in the middle uh, between the discussion between Job's comforters and Job and the voice of God answering. Um, there is the voice of Elihu, who is a transitional figure. Um, some have even said comic relief. I don't know if I'd go that far because I think he makes some good points. But between Job's comforters and Job and then the, the drama kind of turns on Elihu um, so that we are prepared to hear the response of God himself. If we look at the verse, the, the wisdom literature that is found in Ecclesiastes, uh, then we could find a couple of different things. Um, Kohelet is the word, the Hebrew word for preacher. So one who is calling together the assembly, and so that's how the book begins, the words of the preacher. Uh, so that, that's why his name is Kohelet. And he can be relentless in facing the final emptiness because it is the truth about this passing world and because there is a larger truth to live by. Um, so that is uh, Kohelet's purpose, to look at the vanity of vanities, the things that are um, empty, hollow, under the sun, and then to show what is good and right, true, good and right and true, things to do in the course of our short life until we meet God face to face. And his advice is to fear God and keep his commandments. Remember your creator and know that God has made in your life the twisted things as well as the straight things. And he has called you to enjoy the good gifts uh, that he has given you. We need to see those good gifts coming from his hand. Uh, so that is the, the book of Ecclesiastes. Proverbs then is uh, those uh, momentary, the, the quick two-liners uh, that display in a practical sense uh, wisdom. And uh, it is not wisdom from a guy sitting on a mountaintop. It is passionate advice from a father to a son. Uh, please gain wisdom. Whatever you do, gain understanding. Um, the distinctive motto for the book of Proverbs is that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And Proverbs engages the whole man. Every area of our lives um, must be impacted by wisdom. And then um, what I like about wisdom literature in general, and then Proverbs in uh, specific terms, is that it's international in scope. I can imagine in my mind that when people come to visit Solomon and Israel, uh, that they sit and they lounge and they teach and they learn. And uh, so it's understandable and profitable whether you are from far away or near. Um, it is international in scope. And I really like this quote from um, the Literary Guide to the Bible, because it describes that impact that God's word in the wisdom literature can make internationally. To engage in these mind-sharpening encounter, encounters with all comers was to bring one's beliefs out into the open. It implied that the truth one lived by was valid through and through, and that its writ ran everywhere. It also suggested that shared ground existed between the truly wise of any generation. So there we are, a little bit of an introduction. I hope, we'll, hope uh, something there tantalizing enough that'll make you dive in and make that fruitful for you uh, for the rest of your life. So look forward to continuing our survey of the genres next time. Thanks for hanging out.